Hey YouTube, thank you so much for uh, clicking on this sermon. We really believe and have been praying uh, that God will use it to minister to your souls. Um, we just ask for you to do a few things. First of all, would you like and subscribe to our account? Uh, we really believe God wants to use this to advance his kingdom. Uh, and the second thing we would ask for you to do is if you are in the area, uh, we would love for you to come to one of our services. Uh, you can find out more information on our app or on our website. Uh, so we have been praying that God will use this and we believe he uh, will uh, come through on that. So uh, enjoy um, and blessings on your life. And so what um, has been happening is we have asked or allowed you guys to ask any question that you have, and then from that, I would respond to that question. Um, I have had numerous people come up to me and tell them, tell me how much this has encouraged them, has blessed their soul. Um, I know for me, these last few weeks has really helped encourage my walk with the Lord. Uh, and so I think I have about 12 questions left, uh, and I hopefully have been able to answer all of your questions, or today we'll be able to answer your questions. But the reality is, um, um, there were so many questions. I kind of morphed some and reworded some, combined some with the hopes to hit all of your questions. If I haven't hit all of your questions, um, I say this every single week. If I don't answer your question fully, if I don't answer your question at all, if I didn't answer your question the way you liked and it made you mad, um, if the way I answered the question sparks more questions in your heart. Uh, please buy me lunch. I love to eat. I would love to have lunch with you. Buy me lunch and we'll talk more uh, about it. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk fast uh, to try to get all these answers in. Let's start with the very first question. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Mark 3, 28 and 29, Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemes they utter, utter, verse 29. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but, his guilt, uh, but is guilty of an eternal sin. This is definitely one of the more difficult sayings Jesus has said, but it is such a strong doctrine for us as a church. The first thing this passage teaches me or teaches us is this. God does forgive. It says that he forgives. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to hope. We don't have to cross our fingers and really, really, really wish that God is in the saving business. No, God desires to save, John 3, 16 and 17. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. That we are forgiven by God and we are always saved, John 10, 28. So what this is telling me is there is a difference between grieving the Holy Spirit, as we see in Ephesians 4, 30, and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So then what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Uh, from all the definitions that I read this week, uh, I like the wording of this one the best. Um, it says this, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is a conscious uh, and hardening uh, opposition to the truth because the Spirit is truth. We know this in John, 1 John 5, 6. It is a conscious and hardened resistance to the truth that leads man away from humility and repentance. And without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sin. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is a continual rejection of the work of Christ done on the cross. Focus on the family, words it this way. By continually rejecting God's free gift of salvation in Jesus, a sinner sears his conscience, ignores the voice of the Holy Spirit, and stiffens his neck. Eventually, he gets to a place where genuine repentance is no longer possible. This stubborn and unrepentant attitude, persistent self-hardening, is the chief mark of a true person who is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The whole reason why Jesus brought this passage uh, in Mark 3 was that the scribes and the Pharisees were rejecting the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. They were going so far as actually attributing the works of Christ to the power of the devil, searing their hearts to the things of God. As they even saw that, they kept turning away from 
repentance. So the question I ask is, where does this leave you? Where does this leave me? My prayer is that all people in this room are not hardening their hearts to the things of God. That no one in this room has rejected the call to repentance to the point of hardening your heart. My prayer is that all have begun a relationship with Jesus, not just embraced a religion of a church, but an actual relationship with Christ. My fear is that there are many in this room who are religious, who you come just out of Uh, your fear or out of a sense of religion, not out of a relationship with Jesus. I hope my words over the next few moments will weigh on your shoulders. Um, I hope that you ponder your decision, that you do not stiffen your neck or harden your hearts to the things of God. I hope that your heart becomes softened. My prayer is that the conviction today is so strong that by the end of this service, you will nail down your relationship with Jesus and not harden your heart again. I would challenge the believers in this room. If you know Christ, please over the next few minutes, would you begin praying that God softens the hearts of that person in this room who does not know him? Pray for the next few moments that someone in this room will seek repentance um, and grow in the gospel of Christ. Because there are those in this room, there are those in this world, that you will sear your heart so much to where you have turned away from the things of God, breathe your last breath one day, and spend eternity apart from the blessings and glory of God. But as we talked about a few weeks ago, in this place called hell, experience the the full defined wrath of God as he pours out as a holy God wrath towards sin. And my heart is that you repent. My prayer as your pastor is I beg you that you repent and turn to Christ and do not stiffen your neck yet another time. Question number two kind of ties into this. Do Catholics... Do Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, do they go to heaven? Again, make, let me make this clear. The only way you go to heaven is a life who has repented of their sins and has been justified by the death and resurrection of Jesus. They have paid their debt, uh, that he has paid their debt and made them whole in Christ, that believers are bought with a price, as 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us. Jesus has paid your debt. Please hear me. I don't care if you have come to this church from the time you were born to the time you die. If you have not softened your heart to the things of God, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But the question asked is a little bit different or a little bit deeper. Uh, These religions, and I use that specifically, use the name of Jesus but don't hold to the biblical teachings of Jesus. When you understand world religions, when you understand religions across the board, the main distinguishing factor, in my opinion, between all religions is what are you doing with Jesus? And let me be clear, there is a drastic difference between denominations of a religion and an actual religion. We get this confused from time to time. Um, The definition of a religion is a belief in or worship practice of a personal God or of gods. There are three major world religions, the big ones that we think of, right? You have Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Denominations are subsects of these major religions that focus on more open-handed things, right? Religion are closed-handed things, things that we cannot agree on. Christianity, Jesus is the Son of God. Salvation only comes through him and him alone. Islam, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Those can't agree, 
because those are two very distinct, different, closed-hand things. So the difference between a religion and a denomination is religions are closed-handed things, denominations are more open-handed. The funny joke, Baptists don't dance, Pentecostals dance everywhere, right? There's a drastic difference. That doesn't define Jesus. It's just they operate a little bit different. That's the difference between a denomination and a religion. Now, let me be clear where I stand on this. Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, and even Catholics are not a subset. They are not uh, a denomination of Christianity. They are a separate religion all together. Because their view of Jesus is so different than the biblical teachings of Jesus. These, like all other religions, are false religions. Why? Because they're works-based, not repentance-based. The main difference, again, is that concept of Jesus for Christianity is the only religion that talks about how God came to us. All other religions are a work-based mindset of how we can get to God. There is a distinct, distinct difference. But to answer your question uh, uh, in a more broader sense, um, do Catholics, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, do they go to heaven? Again, the only way you can go to heaven is through Jesus and Jesus alone. And let me say this. Jesus can use whatever means he pleases to save a sinner. Has God saved someone in the Catholic Church? Of course, just like he has saved people in this church. God is not saving us to a building. He is saving us to a relationship with him. Jesus has saved people in Walmart. Save, I know, Walmart. I mean, it's not even Target, like Walmart. Uh, like, he has saved people. He has saved people on the battlefield. He has saved people in VBS camps. He has saved people on their deathbed. Our God is in the saving business. Now, whether or not he has saved you, um, I, I mean, w- when he has saved you, I don't personally believe you can stay in the Jehovah's Witness, uh, Mormon, or even dare say the Catholic um, religion. I, I, can, I don't believe you can um, from that. Why? Because it's just so drastically different from that of um, what I believe is true Christianity. Um, and when it comes, when we talk about salvation, we talk about salvation from these, these things, we have to be very clear on who Jesus is. Who's the Jesus they're talking about? Because just because you have the same name doesn't mean you are the same, they're the same person, right? Um, and so we have to talk about what is the means of salvation when it comes to these. Our God is still in a saving business. I do not have the time to dive into it. We have a book over here that deals with... Uh, with different cults and world religions. I encourage you to, to get that and look at that and study that. Um, but if you have come out of one of these religions, which I know we have, I know we have former church members and current church members who have been there, let's have more lunch. Uh, let's talk about it more and discuss Jesus more at length. Um, but let's go on because I don't have time to, to, to go anymore, and I think these will answer more of that. Uh, Next question, Uh, if a believer is willingly and knowingly living in sin, are they really a believer? Um, Can a believer be saved even if his life or her life has no fruit? Great question. Do Christians sin? Yes. Do Christians knowingly know they're not supposed to sin uh, and yet still sin? Yes. We are always justified in Christ by the work of Jesus, not by our works. Um, But we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, should fight to sanctify our lives every single day, Philippians 2, 12. But me and you will always struggle with sin. Why? Because we're in a broken, sinful world world. It will not be until you breathe your last breath, step before the presence of God and become truly glorified that we will not feel the sting of sin anymore, truly taking hold of the salvation awaiting us. 
1 Thessalonians tells us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Does this mean that when we forget to give thanks in just one circumstance or stop praying for just one moment, we're not true Christians? Of course not. We need to be careful not to put a religious weight on the backs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Just because you're running your Christian race a little bit faster than someone else, it doesn't mean they're still not moving. Now, this doesn't mean people get a pass on sin. I would caution your soul. If your heart is cold to the things of God, if you love this world more than the things of God, I would caution your soul. Let me say it this way. It is not a single act of sin or not even a few acts of sins or even a periodical act of sinning, but it is rather a settled, persistent continuation of sinning that should mark a red flag in a church attender's heart. Do you think or cannot think about living without this particular sin? The Bible is not soft on sin, and I am not soft on sin either. There are many churchgoers who have experienced God through religious experience or religious knowledge, but chose their sin over the things of God. Hebrews 10 tells us this. This is where I would caution your soul. I pray that the Spirit is working on your heart now. Are you truly converted? So the simple question, uh, so this is, that's a simple question to that first part of the answer, um, and we can talk more about that over lunch. Um, but I want to tackle the, the second part of that, um, and that's the bearing fruit aspect of it. And this question, actually, I would believe is very subjective when you look at a person. Um, because they may not be bearing fruit in just the area that you're observing. Let's just use Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So imagine a scenario, right, where a wife um, is spiritually patient. Right? She's just a spiritually patient type person. Uh, she doesn't blow up. She doesn't freak out. She doesn't throw things. She's just spiritually patient. She's got it settled. Now she's observing her husband from the lens of patience and finds herself looking at him as he blows up here or there, screams and yells here or there. And if she's only looking through that one lens, she'll look at him and go, my husband's not saved. Look at him. He has no fruit of patience in his life. He is not saved. But the reality of the situation is um, the wife may be self-righteous. She may beat her husband down with the Bible. She may not be gentle. She may not be kind with her words. She not, may not be very loving with her actions. And she may be doing all these things, sitting here wondering, why is he blowing up at me? Well, maybe if you're a little more kind and gentle, just because the Holy Spirit has settled something in your heart doesn't mean he still doesn't need to settle more things in your heart. We could probably say the same thing about your life if we look at your life from one specific angle. Here's what I want to say when dealing with corrections, because we've all been there. Husbands and wives, we've been there when dealing with correction and talking about biblical things with our spouses that have at some point in time end in arguments. Here's what I love about this. I love using Bible verses over uh, you statements. We have all said the you statements. You don't do this. You don't do that. You should do this instead of doing that. Church, may I encourage you that the world is hard enough. Our flesh longs to be in control, that we don't need other Christians beating us down with you statements. We need other brothers and sisters in Christ bringing us to the word, pointing us to the word and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us back into repentance because community is hard. The gospel is needed in all aspects of our lives. May we show a little more grace to the people around us. 
And I would say this, don't judge a person just by their one season. Judge them by the long haul of their life. Because we can use this and flip it. There are many people who stand from stages like this and stand behind pulpits like this who have great ministries and appear, uh, have the appearance of bearing great fruit and doing great things, but over the long haul, they fall, they turn away from God, they have all these multiple different sins that all come out, and we would all sit here and look at them for that short season and go, man, they are truly a believer. Look at all the potential fruit they have, but all behind it's rotten dead. But then you could have a prodigal son who has a season where he has wandered, But the loving and gracious God draws him back unto salvation, and that child begins to bear fruit and grow. Let's not judge people just by a a small season, but over the long haul. So let me best answer this question this way. Speak the truth. Live out the truth. Love people in all circumstances. And let's let God sort the whole thing out. I mean, it's his job anyways. Amen? All right, next one. Uh, spiritually, is it okay to forgive someone but not fully trust them? Can that come later? Uh, like getting saved, forgiven, but not immediately changing all of your ways. Uh, it's a process, sanctification. Um, I read an article this week uh, that the writer says it this way. One of the greatest battles for holiness and love in the Christian life is the battle to avoid my sin in response to other people's sins, which I feel may have sinned against me. All married couples would agree uh, that this is probably one of the hardest things of a marriage, right? They something, do something to you, they hurt you, they say something to you, and then you're quickly sharp or do and hurt them back, right? Hurting people hurt people. We've all been there. We justify our sinful actions while judging the other person's actions. Yeah, I chewed her head off. Yeah, I stormed out. Yeah, I called her a bunch of things. But she did this. Justify our sins by pointing out theirs. Listen, they may have hurt you um, and, or even angered you, but in the midst of your anger, uh, we should not sin, Ephesians 4, 26. When hurt... We should bless. First Corinthians 4, 12, 13, it says, we are all, when we are verbally abused, we respond with a blessing. When, persecu- when persecuted, we endure. When people lie about us, we answer in a friendly manner, as Scripture says. I have not done this well. I will openly admit I have failed at this time and time again. But here's where I struggle with this question. Trust does have to be earned back. A marriage where one spouse has wounded the other, it will take time to heal. But during that process of healing, let's let it be God's timing, not our timing. Because I believe there are still many people holding on to a pain, not fully trusting again, and God already told you to let it go, but you won't. It's a very dangerous place to be because that brings bitterness and anger and frustration. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, For if you forgive others of their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, this isn't a salvation requirement, right? We've already settled that. The only way to get to heaven is through repentance of Jesus. What this is talking about is that there is an issue with your heart. Check your heart heart. Are you embracing unforgiveness and hurt over holiness? Those should be red flags that maybe you are not truly saved. And so I would caution your soul. I would give you homework. Here is your homework. We're not producing lazy Christians. Philippians 4, Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Again, Philippians 4, 1 through through nine. One last time, Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Go home. Spend an hour in this passage. It's nine verses. Just find the nuggets of gold in here because this passage, I'm telling you, will help you if you ask this question. But during this entire series, we talked about not wanting to forgive and how dangerous that is. Like I would caution, and again, this is the word I'm using for this service, for this sermon. I would caution your soul If you have such bitterness towards someone that you can't even imagine forgiving them, I am worried 
for your soul. I would caution your soul because that shows that to me that the Holy Spirit's not in it. I get that healing needs to take place. I just don't believe that we should hold on to bitterness and resentment forever. I believe when God tells us to let it go, we let it go. Um, next question. What does the Bible say about suicide? Um, I want to thank you for asking this question. Um, I want to encourage you to speak to someone if you're contemplating this. I believe the biggest lie the devil will ever try to tell you is that you're alone. Please hear me. You are not alone. You are not alone. People love you. People are here for you. If you are struggling with these thoughts, speak with someone. Please hear me in this. I would greatly mourn you. I would greatly mourn if we lost you. I would greatly mourn if you, um, if you take your life. To answer this question, though, to be honest, for some of you, to walk through this and walk through this pain could take weeks months, even years to biblically unpack this in your heart because it's just not an easy, generic statement. And to be honest, if I gave you a three to five minute answer, it may not suffice and it may actually put more hurts and wounds in you. Listen, salvation doesn't produce cookie cutter Christians, but it does produce an eternal journey that involves a daily struggle here on earth. We are not meant to walk this journey alone. You are not alone. Parents, I would encourage you, if you have teens, this question, Chris is going through a question series. This question was asked in teens as well. Parents, I am not telling you to go home, kick in their bedroom door and be like, did you ask this question? Well, I'm not asking you to give them the third degree. I'm not asking this. What I, here's what I'm asking. Press in. Find a moment in time with your teens. Press in. Don't just think they're okay. This world sucks. Don't think your teen is okay. And don't think five minutes sitting around the dinner table is enough. It's not. Find an avenue to press in and talk with them about this. So let me give you a really short answer to this very complex question. I'm here to help. Call me. Email me. I've put my cards up here. And here's what I want you to do. A simple email, simple text message. Pastor, you owe me lunch. From the beginning of this sermon series, I have always said, you buy me lunch. If you're struggling with this, you don't have to tell me. You could walk up to me afterwards and just look me in the face and go, Pastor, you owe me lunch. And I'll know. Brittany and I will move heaven and earth to meet with you and to talk with you if you're even thinking this thing. Simple response to me, simple text message, simple email, Pastor, you owe me lunch. And it's Ruth Chris if you want. Now, don't you be lying to me, but it's like, <laughs> but hear me in this. Like, you hear me in this. If you are struggling with it, we love you. Brittany and I love you. We want to meet with you and walk this journey with you. We would greatly, greatly mourn your passing. All right, next question. I don't have time to keep going. Um, please explain Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Um, I have never done anything as great as these things listed. How much more do I have to grow in my relationship with Christ before I am no longer in fear of being turned away? Um, let me read the passage. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many powerful deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreakers. This question, I believe, again, shows a religious thinking. It is not about us doing enough to earn heaven because, frankly, we can never do enough to earn 
heaven. We don't do good to get Jesus. We do good because of Jesus. It is not working um, our way to heaven. It's living here on earth, the life that reflects the way he already sees us in heaven. See, these people did religious things, but they didn't have a forgiven heart. Jesus calls them, declares them lawbreakers. So what it shows to me was they were religious people without a relationship. I caution your soul. I am fearful for your soul. And to be honest, this is the passage that saved my soul. The guy came and stood here and said, many of you will do religious things, but you are far from God. And at 17 years old, I was doing a ton of religious things, but I never had a relationship with Jesus. I hope this weighs on your heart. Do you know Jesus? How I would answer this question is, I would just start getting to know Jesus more. Spend time in his presence, not just in his service. I think so many times we think we could just do things for him. Spend time in his presence, not just in his service, because the more you spend time in his presence, the more you will do his will. Um, a few more questions and we're done. Um, are there still true prophets today? Does the Holy Spirit still speak through people today? Are there other gifts of the Spirit, healing, etc., still valid, or have they ceased? Great question. To be honest, it's a very complex question, and there are godly people on both sides of this argument. But I want to give a very simple answer to, again, a very complex question. God can do whatever he wants. Is he still in the miracle business? Yes. Can he use people to heal you? Yes. He may use a doctor to do it, or he may use someone to lay hands on you. He is God. Quit telling him what to do and start letting him tell us what to do. I would also say um, sickness is not always a sign of sinfulness. And healing isn't always a sign of blessing either. Now when dealing with the prophets, here's what I want to caution you. I'm not saying they don't exist. But let's not be so quick to listen to the latest prophets podcast and neglect the presence of God. Whatever they're saying must align with the word of God. If not, they're a false prophet. Avoid them. Flee from them. Um, I also believe we are in the church age. I believe after Pentecost, we transition to the church age. At that point in time, you have to start asking yourself, who are they submitted to? Do these prophets, do these people have pastors and ruling elders over their lives, as Hebrews 13 tells us? If they don't, I would be very cautious of them. Traveling speakers, preachers, apologists. We just had that come out a couple months ago. Bible studies, musicians, if they do not submit to a local governing shepherd in their lives, I would caution that. That would be a major red flag. Community isn't easy, but we are called, called to community, called to be submissive to our leadership. We are called to trust our leadership, believe our leadership, question our leadership, and hold our leadership accountable, church. You don't just blindly follow. You question, you challenge. I love membership. I love that we have people in membership. Why? Because I know who I can speak into, and I know who I can let speak into me. Because when you join membership, you say, I'm dying here. This is the church that I am bleeding for, and that gives you weight to speak into the direction of our church, to have conversations about it, and allow us to prayerfully seek the way God has called us to go. And so I would say that if any uh, prophet, whatever, speaker, Bible study, and if they don't have a ruling elder over their lives, um, some, they are not submissive to it, I would be very cautious because I think the Bible speaks against that. And we can talk more about that over uh, a really good steak. Um, all right, uh, a few more and we're done. Uh, when the tomb was entered on the third day, or, uh, 
it was found that the tomb was empty and the burial cloth lying there uh, and the face covering was found to be neatly folded. What is this significance? What's the significance of this? Um, I think this is interesting. Um, and uh, we talked about this a, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about translations from Greek and English. It don't always give the clearest picture because the English language is so boring. Um, and then stories come from this. So there is a story that's floating around out there right now that said back in the Jewish time when um, a master got up from the table, if he threw his napkin on the table, at that point in time, the servants would know, okay, he's done eating, clean, clean the table and let's go wash the dishes. But if a master would fold the napkin and place it on the table, it meant that the master was coming back, don't touch, wait for his return. And so then the story goes, Jesus' face covering was night, his napkin was nicely folded and placed. And so then for all of us, what we hear and get pumped and excited about is, oh, that's it, Jesus is coming back and all we just got to do is wait. And that gets us excited and pumped. But how do we solidify this? Is there a way to solidify this great story? And, and sadly, to be, honest, to, be, to be straightforward, we can't really solidify this story. Um, because the word for folded is actually translated as folded in the NIV and the, KJ, uh, the New King James Version. But others translated actually as rolled up, NASB, ASV, RSV. Um, and the King James actually calls it wrapped together. That Greek word, eskaleos, uh, which actually means to twist or to entwine. So from the bottom line of this, there's actually no agreement that that actual word could mean neatly folded. Now it could, but we don't have solid, solidification on that that word actually means that. And on top of that, that story of the master folding his napkins, um, in biblical records and numerous Bible study sources have been checked in Jewish customs, um, they can't find any reference to that story in the past. The earliest we can find reference to that is actually an email chain posting. Remember back in the day when people just forwarded you just junk all the time? Um, the, the, we can only find that dating back to 2007. So is this story true? Does this story have weight? Is it something for us to be encouraged on? I mean, you can't, we can't prove it. But here's what we can. Jesus died. Three days later, he rose again. Regardless if it was folded, twisted, tossed in the corner, Jesus was dead and now he's alive. And that's the story we should be telling. Um, okay, uh, what happened? Oh, man. Okay, what happens immediately after we die? Um, give me just a few more moments. Uh, the Bible doesn't give a bunch. Oh, I have time. You're fine. You're not beating the Baptist to lunch. All right. Uh, the Bible, uh, okay, what, um, what happens immediately after we die? Now, the Bible doesn't give a bunch of details concerning what happens right after we die. Um, it is certainly safe to say uh, that we enter into a reality that is far beyond anything you or I could imagine. Um, but I was reading an article that gives three things on, or five things about why we die. Number one, first, believers will be taken into the presence of Christ in heaven. The moment you die, believers will be taken to Christ in, he uh, in heaven. Christ is in heaven now. Acts 1, Acts 3, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. And believers will go and be with him. So when you die, you will be taken into the presence of Christ in heaven. Number two, uh, heaven will be a place of splendid glory, and being with Christ in the glory of heaven will be far superior than our present and earthly lives. Amen. Paul talks about this, that it is actually far better to go to heaven in Philippians 1, uh, and that he would actually rather be absent from the body so that he can be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Um, number three, about heaven. Uh, when uh, in heaven will, uh, sorry, when in heaven, we will be continually looking forward to the resurrection of our bodies from the dead. This is interesting. Disembodied existence is, in, is not God's ultimate and final and greatest purpose for you and I. As great as it will be to be in heaven after we die, God has something greater in store, being resurrected from the dead so that we will live soul and body forever forever in a new heavens 
and a new earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Number four, at the moment of death, believers will be made perfect and cleansed from all sin, glorified. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, Ephesians 5. Number five, uh, those who do not trust Christ in this life will be separated from God's grace and blessing and for all eternity experience the divine wrath of a holy God. Matthew 13, Matthew 25, Luke 12, John 3, Romans 2, Hebrews 10. The reality of all of this is that we as believers should not fear death. We as believers should cling to Christ and hold to a God who loves us and a God who says, do not be afraid. How can someone attack Christians, other Christians, who do not vote for the same candidate as them? People have fought and died for the freedom to vote for who they want. How should a Christian handle voting? Um, I can't argue with your conclusion. Many godly men, or many people, just many people, not godly people, just many great men and women have died for our freedom. And the reality is, I think it's an honor and a civic duty for us to vote. I believe all Christians should vote. Um, I believe all Christians should vote uh, biblical lines, not party lines. Um, Christians have just become another group politicians pander to. Um, we need to quit voting for the lesser of two evils and start voting for godly men and godly women. I'll talk more about that when the election comes around. Um, um, all right, I'm going to give you a quick little break, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, could you explain the tree of life in the book of Revelations? Uh, is this the same tree that was in the Garden of Eden, and will it be relocated to the new earth? Okay, this is a great question. Um, and I know you guys need a quick little break, and then I finish the last answer. I have a video I want you to see. It's, a, it's two or three minutes long. Watch this video to answer that question. The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the Tree of Life. So, what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it, or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Oh, you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground. Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine 
that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seemed that way. But Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now this new tree of life stands before us all. We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden, which is also a kind of temple with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it. And so the reality of everything that I have been saying here, this whole story comes back to this one question. What are you doing with Jesus? What are you doing with Jesus? Are you choosing your own way of thinking? Or are you choosing a new life in him. Let me conclude this question series with this last question. Was the parable of the sower a certain condemnation of a bad heart, uh, heart soil, or a warning to change our hearts? Matthew 13 tells, Jesus tells a story of four soils. A seed, the good news, the gospel of Christ is spread by God. This good news is spread all over the earth and using us to be its proclaimers. But the seed falls on four different soils. You have the path, the rocky soil, those, the soil with thorns, and the good soil. Jesus tells us the meaning in par- of this parable in 13, 18 through 23. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches what is sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed sown on the rocky ground is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but has no roots in himself and does not endure. When the troubles or persecutions come because of the world, immediately they fall away. The seed that falls among the thorns is the person who hears the word, but the worldly cares and seductiveness of wealth chokes out the word, so it produces nothing. But for the seed sown on good soil, this person is the one who hears the word and understands it, bears fruit, yielding hundreds, sixties, and thirty times what has been sown. Church, this should be a strong warning to us because the reality is two of the four soils have some form of appearance of salvation, but is not truly converted. This entire sermon, question after question, has been boiling down to this. What are you doing with Jesus? Are you truly saved? What is the condition of your heart? Is it just a get out of hell free card? In a religious event, something your parents did? Are you going through the motions? Are you truly converted? My prayer for today is God makes himself real to you. Today, the soil of your heart is good soil. Today, you finally hear the good news of Jesus and your soul is saved. We're out of time, but I'm going to be standing right here. We're going to sing a song. If you're done with this religion... The soil has fall, fallen on, or the seeds have fallen on good soil today. Come forward. 
Let's talk about it. Let me pray for you.